Well, this morning we're going to continue in our series, our Seek and Save series as we lead up to Easter. I'm going to take a moment to review where we've been and then we'll go in a new direction today. Our foundational verse has been Luke chapter 19 verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. You'll notice that that verse is, it says the Son of Man is come. That word is, is present tense. Jesus is not talking here about something that he did in the past. In truth, the Son of Man is seeking and saving the lost constantly and continually. It is something he is doing now and will continue to do until his return. And as we go through the Bible all the way from the very beginning, where Adam sins in the garden, all the way to the last amen in Revelations, the common thread is that of redemption and salvation. You see, as we go through scripture, we pick up a theme. And the theme is, is that Jesus came to bring the lost back to him. You see, everything that was done on the cross was about your salvation. It was done because of his love for you. That's why we have the shirts we have, the cross equals love. It does not equal judgment or condemnation. The foundation of all that Jesus did, the foundation of his entire calling was to seek and to save the lost. That word seek means to actively pursue. You see, all the days of your life, Jesus is in the business of pursuing you. He goes after you. He looks for you. He seeks to find you. No matter how close you are to him, how far away from you, from him you are, he is in the process of pursuing you. That word lost obviously refers to those who do not know Jesus. But when you study the word out, there are other definitions. You see, it also refers to those who have wandered away. You see, many times as we go through life, there is something that tries to get in between us and Jesus. It tries to put distance in between us. Maybe it's a distraction or a disappointment, and you begin to wander away. Jesus came to bring you back. He works to keep you close to him. You see, the enemy that is in the earth today seeks to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus came to make sure that you don't get caught up in that, that he keeps you close. And the last definition is for the word save. That word save means to deliver from spiritual destruction to spiritual salvation. Most of us understand that word from the broad sense definition that we're accustomed to. That Jesus came to save us so that at the end of our life we won't go to hell, instead we'll go to heaven. And while that is a part of this definition, there is more to it. You see, Jesus' salvation is for the here and now. He came to save you today so that your life can be whole, so that you can be repaired and restored. So over the last few weeks, we've studied different examples of how Jesus seeks people out. He goes after them and he delivers salvation into their lives. He works to make their life whole, to repair it and to restore it. And as we went through the scripture, we saw how Jesus commissioned the disciples to go. And we've issued a challenge to you, our church family, that the gospel cannot stop with you. Just as the disciples were commissioned to go, you are commissioned to go. So today we're going to go in kind of a new direction. You see, we've been focusing on how Jesus seeks you out. But today we're going to talk about us seeking him out. You see, seeking is a two-way deal. 
It involves him seeking you and then you seeking him. We have a responsibility to seek God out. If you have your Bibles with you today, would you open them to Matthew 6, verse 33? It's a famous passage of Scripture. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. We understand that God seeks us out. But we must also seek after him and his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That word righteousness means God's rightness. God's rightness. When you study this passage of scripture, it says that God is telling us to build our life on what is right from God and not on what is wrong with us. You see, many of us live with a simple belief or an awareness of God in our lives. Yet we never fully submit all of who we are to him and his ways. We never really submit everything that we do to his rightness or his way of doing things. And I would ask you this morning, would you agree with me today? that God's ways are better than your ways. Would you agree with me today that God knows more than you know? Would you agree with me today that God can be more successful at living your life than you can? Amen. Then why do we pick and choose? Why do we pick certain areas and certain things and certain spaces that we're going to allow God into and allow him to dictate? Why do we not submit all of who we are? Because his ways are better than our ways. He knows things that we could not possibly know. And we know this about our God. He has nothing but good plans and good desires and good hopes for us. So when we seek God, then we are seeking his kingdom and his right ways of doing things. When we choose to seek him, then we acknowledge that his ways are better. And then we work to line our life up with his ways accordingly. Let's go to Matthew 7. We're going to begin reading in verse 7. I'm reading out of the Amplified Bible, so I've asked them to put it up on the screen. It says, ask and keep on asking, and it will be given unto you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. Verse 8, for everyone who keeps on asking receives. And he who keeps on seeking finds, and to him who keeps on knocking, the door will be open. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Why? Because if you will ask, the door will be, the the answer will come. If you will seek, you will find. If you will knock, the door will be open. In, verse, in that same chapter, we skip down to verse 11. Verse 9 and 10 begin to describe a father's relationship with his child. And in verse 11, it says, If you then, evil or sinful in nature as you are, know how to give good and advantageous gifts to your children, how much more will your father, who is in heaven, Perfect as he is, give what is good and advantageous to those who keep on asking. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Why? Because we serve a good God. Amen. And how much more will your father give to you if you will ask. You see, my family, this is God's will. It is God's will that when you seek 
you will find. It is his will that when you ask, you should receive. It is his will that when you knock, the door should open. I just want to take a moment to encourage you this morning to recognize the magnificence of how much God really loves you. How much he really wants for your life to be good. You see, as we read in Matthew 7, he says, come. He says, ask. He says, seek. He says, knock. He doesn't say, let me think about what sort of response I will have for you or let me ask around and see how you've been behaving and how good you've been. No, he just says, come and I will welcome you. Seek and you will be found. Ask and you will receive. Knock and I will open the door. Amen. James 4 verse 8 says, draw near to God. And then he will draw near to you. So how do we seek God? How do we get near to God? I believe that there are three ways. Number one, we come to church. We gather in the house of God where the Bible tells us God's eyes are and his heart is always. We come to church. Number two, we study and learn his word. You see, in my family, it's not enough to just listen to messages being spoken by pastors or to read scriptures on plaques or pictures. You must actually take hold of the word and you must begin to study it and understand it. The Bible says to meditate on the word, to get it deep down into your heart so that you have a deep, profound relationship with it. You must study the word. And the third way that you seek God is through prayer. This week, we've set aside five days to pray and to fast. Why have we done this? You see, we've set aside this extra time so that we can spend it with God, so that we can seek him in an unusual way. And we are believing that God will respond back in an unusual way. Amen. Philippians 4 verse 6 and 7 in the Message Bible says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let your petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness or everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. You see, it's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. You see, God created prayer, my family, as a way for you to settle the frets and worries. Prayer is such a spectacular and important part of our lives as Christians, yet as unfortunately so many people live their life and they either casually pray or don't really pray at all or they don't pray the right way because they don't understand it or maybe they just ignore the concept completely. And so this morning as we talk about seeking God, we're going to talk about what prayer is and what it is not. Would you put the first slide up first? If you're taking notes, what prayer is not? Number one, prayer is not complicated. Prayer is just you talking to God. It doesn't have to be something complicated. It's not supposed to be a bunch of vain repetitions that you memorized as a child. It's not supposed to be boring or mundane, and prayer is most definitely not to be a form of punishment. Prayer is not a religious duty, and it is not something that is held for a select group of people who are super holy or religious. No, prayer is for everyone. It is your way to talk to God, and prayer is not a formula. Prayer should be specific 
to you. It should be your individual thing. It should embody who you are and your personality. So as I look at that list of what prayer is not, then I can draw this conclusion that prayer can be done in the wrong way. Prayer can be done foolishly. Let me give you an example. The woman who walks into church and sees the super hot guy over on the other section and determines in her thoughts that that guy is definitely not happy with the woman who he's sitting next to. And she begins to pray that God would somehow give her the desires of her heart. This is a foolish prayer, amen? That God will not answer. Another example of a foolish prayer is, oh God, please, I'm asking you, be with me, don't leave me. Why is that a foolish prayer? Because the Bible teaches us that God will never leave me, nor forsake me. Amen. He is always with me. Oh God, please don't be mad at me. Please don't punish me. Oh, that's ridiculous because the Bible says that God takes delight in you all the days of your life and that he is always on your side. Amen. So let's talk about what prayer is. If you're taking notes today, the first thing that prayer is, is it is a conversation. It is a back and forth conversation between you and God. You see, most of us have an idea that prayer is just us petitioning God, just asking him for everything that we need. But it was not meant to just be petitioning God. In fact, the majority of your prayer time should consist of your praise. You see, another word for prayer is worship, and we know what the word says. It says that God inhabits the praises of his people. What do I mean? Oh, Heavenly Father, I just thank you today. I praise you, and I worship you for all the good that you are doing in my life. I thank you, Father, that you bore my sicknesses and you carried my diseases. I thank you that you are the God who supplies my needs. I thank you, Father, that you loved me me, that you sought me out and you saved me. Amen. You see, prayer is not just about what you're asking God for. It's about worshiping God. It is your opportunity to be yourself. I loved this. After service last night, a woman came up to me and she said, I love the teaching. And I was reminded of the very first time I prayed and I called God, dude, And I kind of chuckled, and then I thought, you know what? I think God loves that. You see, as an adult, I have learned to just be myself with God. Why am I going to put on some kind of phony act with God when he knows the very thoughts that I think? Just talk to him. Be real with him. He knows you, and he loves you, so just be yourself. You see, prayer is your greatest opportunity to get closer to God. Psalms 145, 18 says, the Lord is near to all who call on him. Proverbs 15, 29 says, the Lord hears the prayers of the righteous and he responds. I ask you to think about your most important relationships this morning. Your spouse, your children, your friends, your boss, your parents. How good of a relationship would you have with them if you never spoke to them? How would you even know them if you did not talk to them? How would you know what was going on in their life if you did not speak to them? How could you do a good job at work if you never communicated with your boss? You see, to be close to someone, you must talk to them. The more you talk, the closer you get. It's absolutely no different with God. You see, he wants us to talk to him, and then he wants the chance to talk back. Number two, 
Prayer is your way to come to God and then to receive from God. Prayer is your way to come to God and to receive from God. Hebrews 4 verse 16 says, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Every single one of us who is here today has something that we need. There has never been a time in my life where there wasn't something that I needed from God. And I would say to you today that there is no better place than at the throne of grace to get those needs met. Come boldly to the throne of grace. You have been invited to receive God's mercy and his grace and his help in your time of need. That word come in the literal text means he is ready and waiting. So Jesus beckons you to the throne of grace and he says, look, I'm here and I'm ready and I'm waiting for you. He says, come boldly. That word boldly means to come freely, to come confidently. It means to come with openness and without fear. Oh, but Shannon, I'm avoiding going to God because I need to take care of these things first. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says that he is waiting for you. He welcomes you. He beckons you to his throne and he says, come confidently, come boldly, come without fear, come without hesitation. You see, I love the concept of what this verse teaches because to me, it tells me that prayer gives me the opportunity to have a God encounter on demand. You see, at any moment, I can walk into the throne of grace. I can encounter his mercy and his help anytime, any place. No matter what, you see, he is ready for you. He is waiting for you. You don't need an appointment and you don't need to wait in line. And he just says, come, come. The doors are open, come. Come and be transparent. Don't fear, just come to the throne of grace and be the recipient of his mercy and his help, amen? Point number three, prayer is an opportunity to ask God. To ask God, that word ask means to call on for an answer. Have you ever been in a space in your life where you just didn't know what to do? where there wasn't a clear right direction, there wasn't a clear open door. Well, prayer is your chance to call on God for an answer. 1 John 5, verse 14 and 15 says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. I love the way the message translation reads. It says, and how bold and free we then become in his presence, freely asking according to his will. Sure that he is listening. How many of you are thankful that God is always listening? Amen? Sure that he is listening. And if we're confident that he is listening. We know that what we've asked for is as good as ours. So this is the confidence that we have. If we ask God something according to his will, then he hears us and he answers us. If we ask according to his will, what does according to his will mean? It means this. You see, my family, God knows what is best for you. Sometimes we come to ask and we, we come to God and we ask for something specific. 
and we don't see it happen in our lives and we become frustrated, we become disenchanted, we get disappointed. This morning, I want to encourage you that your relationship with God has to involve trust. You see, you have to trust that God always has the best intentions towards you. And I would remind you today that God knows things that you cannot know. He sees the end from the beginning. And so, therefore, I must then accept that if God does not answer my prayer, then maybe it's because he has a different plan in mind. Because this says pray according to his will, according to what he knows to be best for me. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. How can you say that, Shannon? Because God may be preventing you from stepping into a trap that you can't see because God knows the end from the beginning. He looks into the future and he knows where things are heading. You have to trust that God is aligning you into the right space. Amen. So when we ask according to his will, if you need help, if you don't know what to do, then I want to encourage you in your prayer time to ask God for wisdom. You see, the Bible says if you need wisdom, ask for it. It also says in Proverbs 4 verse 7 that wisdom is the principal thing. If you don't know what to petition God for, if you are facing a challenge then you're not even sure what to ask God to do, then just ask him for wisdom. Ask him to reveal to you where you should go, the choices you should make. Ask him to give you the wisdom to know and to see what you cannot know on your own. Point number four. Prayer is an opportunity to get quiet and to listen. You see, prayer is not just all about you talking to God. Like I said in the beginning, prayer is a conversation. It is a two-way conversation. You see, when we come to God in prayer, we're to petition and praise him. And then we're to get quiet and listen. We are surrounded by a whole lot of noise in our lives. Society today is so busy, it's full of stress and chaos and in fact I believe the noise factor in today's world is louder than it's ever been. You see we're never without our cell phones, we're never without the text or the email, we're never without the noise of the radio or the music or iTunes or whatever it is. We live in a constant state of noise. In fact some of you are probably even uncomfortable when it's quiet. Why? Because you've gotten used to being overstimulated. But you see, in Psalms 46.10, it says to be still and know that I am God. Be still. That word still there means to wait quietly on God. To wait on him without fear or without diffidence. Diffidence means without shyness or anything resulting from a lack of self-confidence. It says just get still. Be quiet. Don't be afraid to hear God's voice. The Message Bible says to step out of the traffic. To take a long, loving look at me, your high God, above politics, above everything. You see, my church family, this is what we're doing this week. We're taking one hour a day to step out of the traffic. To shut out the noise. To step away from the distraction and to get quiet before God. You see, I talk to people all the time and they say, Shannon, God doesn't speak to me. How come he talks to you and he doesn't talk to me? I never hear from him. And I would say, if you're one of those people, do you ever get quiet before God? Do you ever actually give him the chance 
to speak to you or are you expecting some kind of lightning bolt, burning bush moment? You see, I don't think God talks like that very often. I think he talks in a quiet voice. He speaks to those who are willing to listen. I want to share with you a quick story in my own life. A couple of years ago, I was at a doctor's appointment, and the doctor gave me a bad report about one of my children. And that day, I went to the office right after, and I got with my dad and my brother, and I told them what had happened, and I said, guys, we've got to pray. I didn't go run and tell everybody else, and maybe this is a lesson for some of you. When you're facing a battle and you're fighting the enemy, you don't go talk about it with everybody. You only talk to those who can fight the battle with you. You don't need man's opinion. You need God's opinion. Amen. So I began to pray. We all began to pray. And over the course of about eight or nine months, I confessed the word every day. I prayed over my child. I was believing that the report I had heard, that there was no truth in it. And on this one particular day, I was at the office and It just kind of was really bothering me. I was frustrated. I wasn't seeing the change that I was believing to see. I stayed at the office really late that night, and as I left, I put the kids in the car. I was driving back to the west side, and both kids fell asleep. And in an unusual moment of quiet in my life, As I drove on the freeway, I just began to kind of pray. And I said, God, I just, this is really bothering me. And I know what your word says, God. And I'm just believing for a breakthrough. There cannot be truth in what the doctor said. And I just sat in the quiet. And as I passed Cielo Vista Mall, like in one moment, this voice came into my car. And he spoke directly to me and he told me something to do. And that night I went home and I began doing it and I did it for 10 days in a row. And on the 10th day, I was at my office and I noticed a change. And then I second guessed myself because I thought maybe you're just wanting to see what you're seeing. And, but I just began to thank God that the miracle was happening and that night... I went to dinner with my dad, and as he sat across the table from me and my kids, he all of a sudden, halfway through the dinner, looked at me and said, Shannon, there's a change. And I looked at him, and I said, really, Dad, do you see it? And he said, yes. I said, Dad, listen, 10 days ago, I was in the car, and God told me to do this, and I started doing it, and I I think I'm seeing the change. And he said, well, you are. And then... As I looked at him, tears began to fill his eyes, and he said, Shannon, he said, I was at home 14 days ago, and God spoke to me and told me to do the exact same thing. I've been doing it also. You see, my family, I had been praying, but it took a moment of me getting still and quiet before God, for God to speak to me and tell me exactly what I needed to do to experience the miracle I was believing for. Sometimes you've got to get quiet before God because the biggest enemy to hearing God is distraction. How do you know that God is talking to you? Number one, when God speaks, it always lines up with the word. And number two, when God speaks, what you hear will bring you peace. Even if it's hard to do, it will bring you peace. Point number five, your prayers have power in the heavenlies. You see, every single time that you pray, heaven is on alert. Matthew 16 verse 19 says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. How do I release 
this power in the heavenlies when I pray. The way that you do that is that you pray and, through you, and as you pray, you confess his word. Oh, Father, I thank you today that the finished works of the cross rule and reign over me and my children, that what you died for has the final say-so in my life. Oh, Father, I thank you today that no weapon formed against me can prosper because you, God, have already defeated the enemy. And today, I stand as a joint heir to the promises of God, which are always yes and amen. Oh, Father, today, I bind the enemy. And as I bind him on earth, he is bound in heaven. I loose the power of the heavenlies in my life. And as I loose them, they are loosed in heaven in Jesus' name. You see, prayer is your opportunity to come into agreement with God's promises. Amen. I remind you that death and life are in the power of the tongue, that you have what you say. Which leads me to point number six. Your prayer is your opportunity to cry out to God. You see that night in the car. This is exactly what I did. I cried out to God. Why? Because the pain was eating at me. The fear was rising up. The hurt and the disappointment and the questions were beginning to take hold. And before they did, I cried out to God. Psalms 34 verse 17 and 18 says, The righteous cry out. And the Lord hears and he delivers them out of all their troubles. You see, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. And he saves such as have a contrite spirit. You see, sometimes the pain is very heavy. It's so real and you're not sure what to say. Maybe you can't even find the words, but what you can do is cry out to God. When you cry out to God, he hears you and he delivers you. He is there to save your broken heart. He is there to repair and to restore and to make your life whole. You see, my church family, this is what we're doing this week. This is why we've set this time aside. We are inviting Jesus into the forefront of our hearts, of our minds, of our lives, and of our families. You see, we're going to come together and we're going to make petitions to God on behalf of our needs and our worries and our pains. We're going to draw near to God. We're going to seek God. We're going to ask of God. And then we're going to come boldly before his throne of grace and my family. Then he is going to respond. And when he does, he's going to draw near to you. He's going to answer you. He's going to bring deliverance to your life. He's going to give you mercy and grace and help in your time of need. And like Isaiah 58 says, he's going to loose the bonds of wickedness. He's going to undo the heavy burdens and he's going to let the oppressed go free. And he's going to break every yoke. Amen. You see, we're not doing this for appearance sake. We're not asking you to come here so that we can tell people we had thousands of peop people in church during Holy Week. No, we're doing this because we understand the power of what can happen when we seek God out in an unusual way. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Amen. Did you learn some things today? Would you stand with me? Please, nobody leaving. 
Nobody moving. We have three minutes left. I've talked to you this morning about having the opportunity to speak freely with God. And the very beginning point of that conversation starts with you choosing to have a relationship with him. You see, at some point, you actually have to say yes to a relationship with Jesus. Most of you are nodding your head at me because you've already done that. But I believe there may be some people here today who have never said yes to Jesus. And without a doubt, I know this, that if that is you, then this is the reason why you're here today. You see, Jesus has been seeking you. He has been pursuing you to bring you here to this moment. Why? So that he can bring salvation to your life, so that he can save you. See, when he came and he died on the cross, he did so for this reason, so that he can have a relationship with you. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to get right with God. I'm going to give you the opportunity to say yes to him. And when you do, two things are going to happen. Number one, from that moment on, you will live all the days of your lives knowing that at the time that your time on earth is done, that you will immediately go to heaven where you will spend eternity. And number two, the moment that you say yes, you will become a child of God. And from that day forward, Jesus will walk with you every single day. His salvation will begin in the here and now. Now, I don't have time to share with you what all of that means, but this I can tell you. A life with Jesus is a whole lot better than the life you're living. Amen. Amen. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around. If you're here this morning and you would say, Shannon, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Shannon, I need to get my life right with God. Do not hesitate. Do not wait. Do not be concerned about what you've done. God loves you and accepts you just as you are. If you need this moment, if you need to get right with God, I want to pray with you. I'm not going to ask you to come down here. I'm just going to ask you to slip your hand up. If you would like me to pray with you, would you just slip your hand up in the air? Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you're here today and at one time you walked with Jesus, but somewhere along the way you got away from him. You've wandered off. Maybe you've been distracted or you got hurt or you got involved with the wrong people. And I would say to you that today is your moment to get your life back on track, to get right with God again. If that's you, I want to pray with you as well. If you need to recommit your life with Jesus, just slip your hand up so that I can pray with you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, would each person here simply repeat this prayer with me? Jesus, today, I give you my life. Today, I say yes to you. Forgive me of my sins. Be the Lord of my life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for your amazing grace. From this day forward, I am a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give them a hand. If you raise your hands, our ushers have given you one of these CDs. Please listen to it. It explains the decision that you made today. And after service, if you'll take that CD to one of our Connect Centers, our ushers have a free Bible for you. And I just want to encourage you to come back to church so that we can help you get to know the God that you said yes to. Can I pray for you as you go? Father, I just declare today that each one of these people is the head and not the tail. They are above and never beneath. They are blessed coming in and blessed going out. Father, today, as they go forth into the upcoming week, I just thank you that your grace abounds in their life, that you go before them, you prepare the way for them, you make uh, open doors that no man can shut. 
And Father, we lift up this upcoming week in our church, and we just thank you that the miracles are in motion, that supernatural breakthroughs are coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. We love you.